Bradley and Natsume's Abadox for the NES, released in 1989. Or 1990, as always, if one might prefer. My god, do I have a lot to get to. But before this goes underway, I'd like to dedicate this to TTB, made up of Joey, Nick, and Jake, The Advantage, The Mini Bosses, Bit Brigade, Joy Swantek from Las Vegas, Dave White and Joe Redifer from GameSack, Pat Contry, The NES Punk, Norman Caruso, The Gaming Historian, Wee Guy, Vine Sauce, Game Dave, Brentel Floss, 8 Bit Arc Perez from San Antonio, Texas, Keith Apicary, Shane Lewis from Rerez, The Game Doc from Portland, Maine, Al Snow Mock, alias Wizwar 100 from Toronto, Canada, The World is Square, made up of Christensen, Doan, Edgington, Reardon, Corbett, and Borgella, Mike Maverick, Lafitte from Turnabout Entertainment, Hank from Waynesboro, Mississippi, Derek Alexander, Care of Stop Skeletons from Fighting, Some Calling Johnny Ortiz and his Brain Scratch Commentaries team, Mark Cornshack Davis, Tyson and Miranda Markley, The Fantastic Plastics, Ian, the 16 bit hero Bergerson from The Offseason, also his wife and seed, Katie and Felix, respectively, from Nashua, New Hampshire, Matt Liston and Becky Burks from Dover, New Hampshire, Kerry Forbes Hailing from Quincy, Matt Michael and Sarah Rostone from O'Neill's, California, Andrew Lowry and the DIY Crew, Somerville Media Center, Brookline Interactive Group, Anime Boston, South Coast Comic Con, formerly Northeast Comic Comic Con and Gary Summers, AAC or another anime convention in Manchester, New Hampshire, Kinetic Con in Hartford, Too Many Games in Oaks, Pennsylvania, and finally, here's the big doozy. If she's watching this, Dina Natale, aka Cybercat, from the Game Den and the Film Den, the lawfully wedded wife of Lee Davidge from Still Gaming, hailing from Sacramento, California, this is for you. With these out of our fine systems, onto the background plot. It's in the year 5012, literally less than three millenniums from now. Of course, we'd all be dead by then, but I digress. The titular planet has been mercilessly and barbarically devoured to dick all, along with its sole ruler, Princess Maria, I might add, by a soon-to-be-addressed gargantuan extraterrestrial cytoplasmic entity, thereby taking on the form of what Abadox used to be, with a merciless intent on consuming every other planet in its winding path. Unicron, meet your new roommate. What is this entity of which I speak, one might inquire? Parasitus. Para-fucking-citus. Not to be confused with one of the bosses in Chikanda Forever, man. In immediate retaliation for its malicious activities, the galactic military attempts to thwart the brooding pissant alien entity, but with barely any success at all, thus of course leaving the latter announced faction with no other alternative whatsoever but to send out their most capable and experienced guardian, namely Second Lieutenant Nasal, lone survivor of the Force. Oh, by the way, his title has jack shit to do with Star Wars whatsoever. Who else but it, right? Strapped in full futuristic gear, Nasal is out to venture through the forbidden innards of Parasitus and save not only the ravaged planet, but also the true love of his dear life, specifically the earlier addressed Princess Maria, before more shit starts to hit the fan. Gameplay-wise, who could have guessed? Another organic-themed shmup involving a humanoid, aka what I like to call the bastard child of Barai Fighter and Life Force. By now, everyone knows the drill, right? Why about one incoming sinister swarm of adversaries after another, enhance your firepower and shields while avoiding sudden damage, confront two bosses, proceed to the next area, wash, rinse, repeat, and we all know where this is going. But MAN AM I GETTING WAY TOO AHEAD OF MYSELF! As ever, your D-pad migrates nasal around within any organic terrain, both horizontal scrolling and vertical scrolling alike, the latter of which involves a downward motion unlike in Life Force, and B-fires all your main weaponry. A, of course, does fuck all except to shift the range and speed of your shield barrier orbs, which I'll get to eventually. Of course, you've got a turbo controller like I do. You'd be golden, otherwise you'd be fucked, considering this game doesn't provide much in the way of turbo capabilities, well, except if you're close to any enemy or the screen proximity. Getting to the weapon items, aside from the speed boosters and 3-tier glowing shield protection system, your basic pansy-ass blaster swaps to either a 3-way spread, a 5-way beam, a single volley laser, or a multi-volley plasma ring, contained with dual missiles and a quad-segmented shield barrier he can gather. In other words, if you happen to nab one segment, the next three are available but within eventual reach, all of which are stripped of instantaneously upon death via unexpected enemy contact or landscape wreckages, cause again, shmup guidelines. As usual, what types of menaces are we dealing with that's around the dreaded, rotting inner reaches of Parasitus? Oh, I don't know. EVERY MOTHERFUCKING THING! Shit like it's not obvious already! Floating and rolling eyes, skulls, pterodactyls, dismembered jaws, shifting teeth in the style of the aforementioned life force, and cyclopic squids in the surface and mouth areas, aka what I also like to call Cake Hole Centro. Single celled organisms, deadly extending arms, otherwise referred to as the hands of death, rotting heads, spores, and tube cannons in the throat area. Larvae, amoebae, flower like scanners, hydrozoa, skeletal fish, mouth pods, and antibodies in the forest like nerve center and inner sanctum areas. Lymph and brain orbs, crab arms, stomach crabs, and cilia pods in the esophagus and digestive chamber. Hopper pods, armed insectoids, mechanical organisms, and laser barriers in the intestinal channel and its own nearby nerve center. And finally, wall walkers, parasite shuttles, and macabre organisms in tandem with those very same mech motherfuckers and laser barriers in both the tube of death, followed by the core of parasitus. 
but it's the out of place boss and mini boss assortments of each of these areas that set themselves the hell apart from the rest of the competition, about which will be addressed eventually. Make no mistake, however, most of the core adversaries, no pun intended, not to mention the corresponding area hazards, will all but fucking guarantee your chances of survival are for jack shit. In fact, no, even worse, they will make your life a living hell by mobbing the goddamn floor with your ass more effectively than Swiffer, thus, of course, resulting in furious controller wreckage after furious controller wreckage, and did I mention after furious fucking controller wreckage? If your skills and judgments are far from on the ball, hence the usual focal point of our next field of reference. While the controls seem to be a trifle derelict, mostly in terms of your weaponry firing capabilities and determining whether or not to shift Lieutenant Nasal's shield barrier speed, they're not much of a buzzkill to which one can adapt, nor is the ever so forthright, if relatively redundant, gameplay schematics, and as usual, that's no shit either. In terms of challenge, such is the case with every shmup I've examined so far. If you're expecting a cakewalk out of Abadox, consider yourselves gravely mistaken. In fact, that mode of thinking just earned you a one-way ticket to ass backwards nowhereville on the outskirts of Hellview Population 96 and counting. We're looking at you, can't kill yourself. On the surface, while the first area or two are easier than every middle school math and or science test combined, the rest of this aptly titled Deadly Inner War by the ill-fated Milton Bradley and Natsume will tempt you, I horseshit you all not, will tempt you to break out your cyanide pills and Jägermeister and consume them non-stop, thus resulting in the most agonizing side effects known to mankind, which by the way will go unmentioned for the time being. For instance, in the second area, aka the first of three vertical scrollers, remember those hands of death I was gloating about? They can either be avoided or wiped out, Christ if preferably the latter. And the less I say about those laser beam barriers and wall compactor machine in the final two areas, which for the record, completely shun the chaos the previous four can provide by comparison, the better. In true Gradius fashion, be on the lookout for their respective warning flashes and maneuvers, cause if you're not past their proximity in time, they'll fry and fracture your ass flat out. Still not convinced? Let's get back to that mini boss and central stage boss troop I brought up earlier. First and foremost, there's this flesher and hellhound, Bao, in the surface area, whose weak point is its backside antenna, and only makes it sleep once or twice, depending on your distance, in conjunction with firing a single multi-directional shot and three blue crystalline projectiles from said antenna. Death face, a rotting head glued onto a wall at the end of Keiko Central, whose only weak points are nary but its freaking peepers, a multi-segmented giant circling guardian worm that travels in a 360-degree pattern, hence its name, which in true scat and shatterhand fashion, also by Natsume, can only be wiped out by its noggin, or again, and its peeper, followed by the final guardian void, composed of four blue pie cannons, one coming from the pie hole of a rotting head in the lower left corner, and a massive pink eye, no pun intended, lodged within the bottom red mouth and the throat area, a skeletal grass covered blue shark with a convoluted yet easy to follow firing pattern depending on your position. It's gotta be a shark thing! <laughs> Honestly, people, this is a game review, not a goddamn indie music variety show for fucking out loud. Anyways, followed by an all-seeing bioorganic guardian with a giant eye surrounded by two antennae on its stomach, one of which is the extreme weak point, along with said giant eye, in both the forest-like nerve center and the inner sanctum individually, the dreaded king crab and cilium monster in both the stomach and supporting digestive chamber, a merciless trio of alien-like mech guardians, followed by their towering android commander, which, while he only retorts with his cranium and ever-shifting arm blasters, he only stands in one place, thus of course rendering himself immobile and like its descendants, in both the intestinal channel and its neighboring nerve area. <laughs> Lazy ass bot bastard. Fuck, even the walker mechs from Gradius 2 and 3, and even the ad from The Empire Strikes Back have more balls than this defective special needs droid. And finally, a band of five purple eyes donning an endless volley of destroyable homing fireballs, with the larger central eye turning out to be the end-all, be-all absolute weak point, followed by who the fuck could've guessed, Parasitus itself, in both the aforementioned Tube of Death, followed by the Extreme Ladder's core innards, following which an escape sequence comes into play, once again, just like Life Force. And by this juncture, you pretty much get the gist of these confrontations. While a few of these vomit-guzzling douches are complete pussies, others will make you lose your sanity in more ways than one might ponder. Should you happen to make it through the latter half unscathed, if barely, with all your full weaponry, whose assortments, yet again, are available depending on which territory you're occupying, the remainder of your course should be no sweat. Otherwise, you'd be fucked worse than the Colonial Marine Corps from Aliens following the grisly demise of Spunk, Meyer, and Pharaoh, despite their desperate ass attempt to evacuate LV-426! Anyways, unnecessary reference aside, take heed of the very same strategies I outlined when I covered Variety Fighter last year. You know, timing, accuracy, alertness, weapon conservation, the whole damn deal. And starting out with two lives and infinite continues, I won't get too brokenhearted should each of these equitable yet agonizing ordeals turn out to be a laborious migraine beyond medical attention. For yet another mid-lifespan shmup, inspired by Konami's one and only spin-off from its juggernaut shmup franchise, hailing from the same year as the much-referenced Barai Fighter, Square Enix's King's Knight, Hudson's Adventures of Dino Riki, Romstar's Twin Eagle, Fabtech and Tatsuka Ball, also put out by Milton Bradley, on whose behalf it was reprogrammed by Rare, the infamous Thunder Kid and Twin Cobra, Twin B3, Zexies, and the like. The visuals are, as many might expect, far from an absolute monstrosity, no pun intended. Second Lieutenant Nasal and the majority of his opposing adversaries are such an appealing myriad of sights to behold, and then some. On the former, both 
opening game and during the opening demo cutscene alike, with the latter having already spoken for themselves, in juxtaposition with the corresponding organic and mechanical scenes they populate, Regarding the bosses, sure, I've seen MUCH scarier ones, then again, haven't we all? But my dear gentle acid puking Christ do they take the Rocky Road Triple Fudge Cookie Dough Sunday with a York Peppermint Patty on top! The early recounted organic and mechanical background areas aren't anything to be taken for granted, let alone scorned upon either, design-wise and animation-wise. Honestly, man, you've gotta hand it to Natsume, considering all the kick-ass sights and sounds they've blessed us with since their inception, whose titles I fully intend to prevent myself from echoing at this juncture. Must I go on any further, for fuck's sake? Music and sound-wise, conducted and arranged by Kyohiro, aka Kyohei Sada, of Konami's Russian Attack, alongside Iku Mizutani, Contra alongside Hidenori Maezawa, The Adventures of Bayou Billy, Top Gun, and even Natsume's aforementioned SCAD, or Special Cybernetic Attack Team in full, and Spanky's Quest fame, the addictive and enthralling ditties don't disappoint in the least, most notably the opening demo, Areas 1, also heard in 4 and 6, Areas 2, 3, and 5, the boss anthem, and even Princess Maria's rescue and ending sequence anthems, all of which fit the overall dark, malignant, and intense organic space adventure theme, and I know what everyone's thinking. Again, Inner space much? Combined with a few of the lesser heard yet optimistic themes, as the player guides the fearless nasal from one body quadrant to the next, and confronts every grotesque entity that stands in its path. While many might end up being turned off by the overusage of a few of these songs, why anyone on Earth would mind said setback is a mystery I'll never bring myself to comprehend. Repetitive as the accompanying sound effects may become at specific intervals, they'll eventually grow on you, if to a foreboding yet oftentimes incessant degree, most notably the heartbeat heard upon coming into contact with the Cilium monster at the end of stage 4. I know, talk about Spook City, right? Regarding Abadox's replayability and fun factor, taking into steadfast consideration how, yet again, most mups like this one aren't given the same amount of respect as many others, due as a whole to the one common foil each of them share, namely the hair-pulling, nerve-boiling difficulty and the corresponding in-game elements, about which, as always, I can't stress the hell enough in reminding everyone to refer back, in tandem with the gory, pulsating, and downright terrifying bodily scenery it offers, as long as you're capable enough of buckling down to and enduring the extremely intense shit that this 8-bit obscurity will throw at you every which way, it's no surprise or secret that you'll be casually if more than likely, thrusting headlong time and again into the unforgettable organic odyssey that is Abadox. Henceforth, in the most profound possible summation, what's my final verdict? It should yet again come as no surprise why, just like Air Fortress, Imperium, and Barai Fighter, Abadox has been long since left under the goddamn radar, despite all the strong points I've highlighted earlier. And while it's nowhere within the scope of other well-regarded, if shamelessly overlooked, schmubs of the era, we're looking at you, Thunder Force and R-Type. It's more than enough to warrant a forever home in one's library. And we all know where this is going, right? Therefore, you'd be doing yourself a shitty-ass disservice by passing up yet another worthy classic, from which I strongly suggest refraining. Do yourself a favor, abandon that modern warfare shit, get your ass out there, and track this game down at any cost! Trust me, it'll make Toho Project look like a slow, tedious ride to Stonehenge, and then some. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God proudly signing off.